On today's episode of the World Ninja League podcast, we cover the Tier 2 World Championships, which happened down in Austin, Texas. I got to be there in person and interviewed Chris Wolcheski, and later on this episode, we'll also be interviewing Nick Fordney, who designed the courses for the event. But first, have you guys registered for regionals yet? If not, you really should because it's your last chance to qualify for the 2023 World Ninja League Championships. This is your last chance to qualify, so make sure to give it your all, stay healthy, and attack the course. And now, on with the show. So, this is the first Tier 2 Championship. So, like, break down like how important that is for the sport of Ninja as a whole. Yeah, well, I mean... My personal vision and uh, the vision of the, of the league is that like you know ninja can be a sport for everybody. So we love seeing like the tier two competitive circuit. It's uh, a nice way for people to break into the sport and start getting involved in the competitive scene, which is really fun. And uh, a lot of like our course design philosophy is kind of like built on like what were popular obstacles, like really like difficult obstacles, like a few years ago where it's like you go back a few seasons and you see like, you know, uh, the, uh, the what essentially was like the tier one championship, like season one. And it's like, you could see some obstacles that are like same difficulty level here today. And it's like, it just makes sense because it's like a, the evolution of the sport. It's like, you're not gonna break into like these crazy special delivery laches and really technical bar movements that kids are doing nowadays. So like, you know, being able to kind of like rewind time and like get new people involved with like those obstacles that are great for like you know your first couple of years competing it's it's just so awesome to see and it's like kind of like reintroducing the magic which we really love absolutely yeah as uh, as someone who just started two months ago unbiased speaking i had a great time bias speaking as someone who's with wnl i had a really great time but no it was really it was awesome. really great time yeah really really great time and it's it's cool to see so many people fly out from everywhere too yeah, I was I was really impressed with the, uh, you know the German community represented uh, you know really well here, um, and then seeing people from from all over the globe, you have people coming coming down from Northeast New England area and people local to South Central. It's just really cool to see uh, you know how widespread the community is and really the demand for that you know beginner level stuff. Well, thanks so much. Again, nice to finally meet you in person. <laughs> Chris Wojcicki, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> All right, so for this episode's interview, we did not actually get a hold of a competitor because otherwise I would have just interviewed myself and I would have had Phil interview me or something because I am my favorite competitor from that competition. Uh, but instead, we got the brains behind the operation. He's the operations manager of Tier 2 Worlds and the course designer for everything we saw at Austin Ninjas in Cedar Park. It is the one and only Nick Fordney. Nick, thank you so much for coming. How's it going? It's going home. Uh, <laughs> this is our first time recording this. I'll, I'll actually show that with the audience. We we're kind of running it back just a little bit because I forgot to record my mic. So we're we're having a good time. But you know what? We had a good conversation so far, and now you guys get to hear that conversation. Um, so for all the people who may not be familiar with you at the moment, uh, Nick, why don't you share your experience with Ninja um, and you know what it means to you? Yeah. So, so I've been. I've been doing engine in the community for about eight years now. Um, I started out in Houston, Texas at Iron Sports, uh, and now I work at uh, Austin Ninjas, where I've been in the past, I think it's almost been three and a half, four years or something like that now. Uh, so yeah, I've been doing it for a long time. I can meet on season 10 and 11 of the show. Uh, season 10, uh, my first year was the first year that they actually lowered the age limit to 19 before they let all these teams on. Um, and so I actually had the opportunity to be one of the uh, first under 21 people to get on the show. So I'm very fortunate for that opportunity. Uh, but yes, yeah, again, I've been kind of focusing in on uh, elite stuff and growing the sport and what we can do you know, behind the scenes. And that's kind of where I've been. Yeah, I definitely. And uh, coming into Tier 2 Worlds, I had asked some friends in Texas uh, as much as I possibly could to learn uh, about the, the gym, the uh, any any type of obstacles they might have had, and and one of my friends, uh, Bo Lewis, he said, "Oh, if if you're at Austin Ninjas, Nick Fordney's designing your course, and his courses are awesome. They're so fun. They're also terrifying sometimes because they're they're really creative and difficult. And I was I was so excited, but at the same time, I was so nervous coming into it. Um, but at, at the same time, the courses were an absolute blast. 
And, uh, and that's something I wanted to uh, talk to you about as well. Uh, because with Tier 2 Worlds, we didn't have the traditional three-stage format uh, that we have for Tier 1 Worlds that's gone as far back as the uh, original, the first season of what was formerly the NNL. Uh, instead, we did a flow course, a full course, and two skills. And so when Chris told you that that would be the format, how did you kind of go about the brainstorming process and, and laying out these courses and skills in your head and then in the gym? Yeah, yeah so, so the idea, idea was, was uh, we had kind of agreed, agreed uh, that, that we were going to try to format that or, or, you know, yeah, we were going to try to make a flow, flow, flow course, course as similar to like stage one, one as we could. could. And then yeah, our full course, course kind of like, like two and three hybrid. hybrid. Um, so the so course being a little more quicker, quicker speed, speed course, course uh, uh, going for speed, getting a little bit higher than theory, rate. Rate. full course, um, definitely, definitely laying out some harder obstacles, um, you know, testing our athletes, um, and again, being a more stage two freestyle course. Um, but obviously, all of this being CL and tailored to our tier two athletes um, as much as possible. And then the skills, um, I just wanted to create some super fun skills. I've posted a few skills in the past. Uh, you know, just yeah. some fun yeah. skills that you can just have a blast yeah. doing, you know, some shade bars and stuff, like swinging around, and then, uh, you know, just a quick back and forth, like yeah. monkey bars and stuff like that. Uh, just kind of get that, it's like warmed up and ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you say warm up, I was, I was, I'm not gonna lie, a little gassed by the time I got to the full course. And, um, you know, part of that is, you know, the cardio training, it, it, it definitely takes a lot. Um, I was a runner before this, and Running cardio is not the same as ninja cardio. It's it's very different. Yes. Um, but for for my division, the adult division, we had to do the full course last, and that was we had cliffhangers at the third obstacle, and we ended with with sideways grabs and everything. And I was I was pumped. Um, yeah, yeah. And and I've also had some friends from Tier One kind of say, you know, when they go to Tier One worlds, they'll skip skills because they don't want to gas themselves out before they take on stage one. Um, they, they tend to aim for more world champion than they do for strongest ninja. Uh, so what would you say the pros and cons are of, of doing the skills before the courses and vice versa? Yeah, yeah. well, <clears throat> you know, 45, 45 seconds and a long time for skills for a minute. But for me, for me, um, as an athlete, because I've had the opportunity to be an athlete and a coach, and now also, you know, behind the scenes courses I am for walls of that. Um, as an athlete, you know, as a coach for some of my athletes at a tier one world event where it's a multi-day thing where you might not necessarily have to do your skill on the same day that you run your courses, um, or if you do, there's a bigger gap in between. Um, I like to, I like to see if you know, my athletes get to do the skills first, basically, because it's kind of like a, uh, you know, let's get the jitters out. You know, it's uh, you get to go on the course and. And try out some of the obstacles that they have, uh, some of which are, you know, new things that they're just doing, or new to you at least. Um, so it's good to get the jitters out uh, before you actually go into the courses. So I would say that's the um, But the cons, you know, like you kind of were saying, if you're stacking up pretty quick, you got a really tight time frame uh, for Tier 2 Worlds. So I could absolutely, absolutely see how some athletes were gassing out by the full course. Um, but, you know, you can gas yourself out if you go hard, which you know, as an athlete, you want to go as hard as possible for everything. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you got way in your way, right? So, um, I think it just comes down to the timing for most of it. Absolutely. And, and that, that flow course had a very, very tight time limit. It was, it was really fun because um, speed courses are, are something that I've always enjoyed watching and I've always wanted to try them. So, it was really cool. You compared those a little bit to uh, stage one that you would find uh, at tier one worlds, but of course scaled back because the tier one ninjas, more advanced, more skilled, more experienced, as opposed to the people you would find in tier two. Um, but looking at the level of the course in tier two, these are some obstacles I feel you would have found a little further back in the earlier days of the sport. In almost not necessarily the pro division, but you would see some top competitors doing that. What, how does what do you think that says about the evolution of the sport and, and obstacle design as a whole? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think that a lot of uh, 
the courses, the courses over, especially over the last four, four years, years, have just evolved at this crazy rate. 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 Uh, so, so you could you take, take a course from uh, two years ago and compare it to, to uh, you know, a course today, today. and it's it's like it's like comparing you know, a rec competition almost to an elite competition in those two years. So, I mean, it definitely is hard to scale everything uh, as a course designer. Um, yeah, I guess especially amongst conditions and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, it's a fun task to figure it out and dial it in. You know, part of what's cool about Ninja is watching the sport grow with the obstacles. There's lots of really cool uh, obstacle designers out there that are creating all this new crazy like tech and obstacles and all these new crazy things. Um, so it's really interesting to see how it's evolved, but it's definitely you know you got to be on top of a lot of stuff. No, exactly. Yeah, and especially with tier two, you you really have to find that balance um, because. It's it, you can't go back to where we were originally because I would say that is too easy for a, a, a vast majority of the athletes who showed up. But you know, going a little too far in the opposite direction to where we are now definitely would have been um, a slaughterhouse of a course. So so kudos to you for finding that balance. Um, I would say an even harder balance is finding a course that you can just modify for different age divisions. So what do you think is the key to that? Um, it, it really, really comes, comes down, down to, to I mean, mean, the idea is, is as far as course design goes, I, I try to look at it from the individual obstacles perspective and not at the whole course in the beginning and then try to, you know, piece together. It's like, obviously, there's something that you can't really scale. Like, multi bars is like a thing that just kind of stays the same unless you add certain things to it. Um, but, but I think. I think being able to scale up and down. I mean, you also have to try to figure out uh, what what each division will look like as far as your competitor list goes. Because, like, if you go to a tier uh, one world event, right? Uh, as far as difference in athletes go, you would think now it should be more kind of similar ish. It shouldn't be too large of a spread, right? Um, but at tier two, you might encounter a larger spread, a rec comp, a much larger spread of athletes that you have to kind of account for. So um, you'll have to kind of, you know, account for different areas where different athletes might go down uh, and be able to. Uh, it's very hard to talk about things, but like, like you have to kind of locate where you want to see most athletes go down in that division, and then. Be able to scale up and down. It does help you. Uh, like the way that we structure our world's event, um, we had, like on our small second side, we had our mature kids go first, which is our largest division. And then we had our kids go second. So for me and uh, for the league, it helps to see kind of the more advanced athletes go first, like the older kids, to be able to scale back. Um, because then we can be like, oh, that was a little too tough for them, so we have to scale this back. And, oh, you know, this was maybe a little too easy. Right. Uh, maybe keep that one the same. You know, you're gonna bump that one up. You know what I'm saying? So, um, for us, at least, doing that helped a lot. Uh, and you know, our most most of the qualifiers are still going that way. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's it's really interesting to see how so many obstacles can change in so many different ways, and it's not ever unplanned um even even as you're describing it uh how you're saying oh you know if we're seeing it in mature kids and we're seeing it as a struggle maybe we don't change it for kids or maybe we do change it for kids it's not a spur it's a spur of the moment decision but it's definitely something that's still calculated and that's i think a real it's just a beauty this whole side of the sport that i don't think gets enough love it, it's it's an art and it's it's a craft that, that you really have to perfect over the years and so i i have so much respect for it um, another thing that you mentioned just recently um, was it also it, you also have to take into account how many uh, competitors are in each division and whatnot. And um, shocker, Ninja has seen a large percentage of their competitor pool be thirteen and under. 
Um, whereas, you know, like, okay, I was in the adult division. There were only seven adult males. There were two or three adult females or, or, you know, there were like four or five, like there, it wasn't a whole lot. Um, the older we got. And so, um, what, what do you think that says about the direction that the sport's going in? And how do you get those kids to keep coming back once they hit those ages, like 13 and older? Um, yeah, another good question. You know, retention, retention at that age, age um, is really is just hard. hard. I mean, you mentioned that 13 and under division basically is where most of the athletes are. That is very true. Like, I, I, I would be curious to see what the, you know, like, 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 like High chart, high chart, tier two worlds looks like, or what tier one worlds looks like, as far as number of athletes competing in each division. Because I'm sure it's that, like, probably 75 or 80 percent, even more than that, probably 85 percent is, you know, those kids. Um, but, but at least what I've seen being a coach uh, for so long, the drop off is entirely just because of like school sports at that age. Um, I think a lot of kids get to the point where they have to choose, you know. Ninja and do something else, or just doing that other thing, and it can be kind of hard to just choose ninja, uh, which is completely understanding. Uh, but as far as attention goes, having more options, especially in the competition field, or even you know at gyms, different levels that kids can get in, uh, to maintain interest, because what what sucks the most, right, is that. You know, a kid goes to a competition to compete because they like to compete, but then they go up against all these guys that are just incredibly talented athletes that, you know, place well nationally and just get slaughtered. And that just doesn't. I mean, I would feel like crap if that's what was happening to me every single cop, and I wouldn't be encouraged to stay around. So I think having all these different options does kind of help diversify and put you in the right place. So you might not be the most competitive, but you still are competitive, and you can be competitive with people that are, you know, uh, at your level. And, and still feel accomplished in doing the sport and feel the need to keep and enjoy it and, you know, growing with it. So, so, absolutely, yeah, it's it's big to have um, more opportunities, absolutely, because I, I think when you get to that age or that middle school, high school age where where you're saying they have to decide between other sports or other commitments and whatnot, it becomes a, it becomes a matter of opportunity. Um, what are these kids going to need going forward? What's going to equip them with things for their future? And does Ninja fit into that? Does Ninja contribute to that? Uh, it, it's it's you know it's a big conversation for for a lot of these a lot of these kids a lot of these athletes, um, and it definitely I definitely could see how that uh, reduces the amount of returning competitors year after year. But at the same time, um, we're still kicking. We still have plenty of opportunities. Uh, one of those upcoming opportunities being the new uh, WNL Premier Series, which uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Austin Ninjas will be one of the locations for that this coming summer. Uh, how does that make you feel, having to go from your... Let's lay out the timeline for all of these guys. They just did Tier 2 Worlds for the beginners. They're doing a Tier 1 Regional for our more advanced ninjas. And then for the very elite, later this summer, they're doing a Premier Series competition or qualifier. So, Nick, how does it feel to cover the whole spectrum of, of ability there? Uh, uh, you know... You know it, it, it's helped me as a course designer to be able to do that. I mean, to even add to that, we have our own like rec competition league that we run. So I did basically all of all of the you know all of the things. Uh, but doing that uh, all these years uh, has definitely helped me evolve as a course designer and see how you can scale obstacles from a rec competition or a rec level team all the way up to you know, the best of the best at the Premier Series. Um, so, not going to lie, like, I love designing courses and stuff like that, but definitely my favorite courses to design are, you know, like, Premier Series level courses. I have the most fun designing them. Um, so, I'm really excited to, to get, get some top-tier athletes in there because, um, you know, we're, we've actually been on a lot of calls with, with the WNL and going over like formatting and, uh, you know, 
rules and you know certain forms of design and things like that. So all the talk that you know we've been having has been super exciting, and I'd, I'd like to see it because it really just helps everything grow. It's like like the idea is you want to get to that point, right? You want to get to that kind of year series level. Um, but you can't just get there, you know, immediately. You gotta start somewhere. So um, I like the idea of having all these options, but. but yeah, between you and me, I really like designing your series. Super fun. <laughs> That's fair. What, what's going to be what's going to be one of the key differences you would say between designing something for a tier one regional and a premier series qualifier? Well, depending on how format everything goes, uh, it could be as simple as I get to put in some more crazy options, uh, so we don't have to you know scale in that sort of say. Because for a, a, a Regional, we are set in at, you know, flow course. So typical flow course, you want to get most of your athletes, regardless of skill level, to probably halfway or just past halfway in your course. And then you want to hit them with their first course obstacle, and then maybe something in between, and then your final, you know, last crux obstacles, right? Um, again, depending on how everything shakes out with uh, what we're talking about with the premier series, um, there could be the option of obstacles, you know, and uh, cooler, crazier obstacles, and, uh, bigger moves, and all that stuff. Um, so you, you get to see a lot more athletes kind of be challenged in a more challenging way. Um, and then, I mean, additionally, too, depending on how it's all formatted, there's going to be potentially like the skills and stuff in there, too. So it's going to be, you know, um, you get to see your favorite athletes basically like race against the clock or race against each other uh, and, you know, proceed from there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the ideal thing to do is that this premier series competitions, those levels, is where you'd want to debut like, like the most craziest obstacles. Um, oh, absolutely. That you would set the sport with, right? right. Where at least you can still do that, right? But it'd be more, it's more so more qualifying for the next race. Right. Right. This is the big stage. This is, yeah, this is that next round. Which exactly. kind of crazy because, you know, for the longest time we've always had it worlds. And now there's something beyond worlds, which, beyond is, which is very, very exciting, but also absolutely nuts. I'm excited. I'm going to get to do a bunch of commentary for it. I'm, I'm excited to just watch it all unfold. Um, yeah. It, it's it's crazy, but uh, taking it a little bit back to tier two, but mainly tier one, um, the top three overall in each division from tier two qualified for worlds for tier one. So that sends that sends about forty other athletes. They're now eligible for worlds. Uh, what do you, what would you have to say to those to those athletes? Give them any advice who are competing? Not me. I'm not competing. I'm, I'm supporting. I'm working. Yeah. There you go. Uh, I mean, I mean, honestly, honestly all those guys, guys that, that performed really well at, 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 at uh, Tier 2 Worlds, like, like, you know, especially if you're on the podium, podium like, like, you definitely yeah, deserve to, to be at the yeah, Tier 1 level. So, um, I think, you know, they're going to have a blast. They're going to get to do a lot more things, I think, there. Um, and, you know, placing, I think, for them, they might even have a little bit of an up to some of the tier one athletes because they already did, you know, world's event. They already felt like the world style pressure, right? Even if it was just in the jam, it's not going to stay the you know, all the people there and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But you got a micro version of that if you've never experienced that before. You got to step up on somebody who's, you know, maybe only focused on tier one this entire year, you know, uh, going into going into tier one worlds. Right. That's, yeah. Couldn't have said it better myself. That was. You can just tell. You can tell all of the knowledge and wisdom you've gained over the years. It's just, it's flowing very eloquently. So thank you so much. Um, Maybe not eloquently, but thank you. Yeah, it's 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 coming out. It's coming out well enough, you know. Um, one one other thing I wanted to touch on in, in regards to the gap between tier one and tier two, um, well, there were quite a handful of, of tier one competitors in multiple divisions who were competing in tier two. Um, and, you know, I, I knew a kid at my home gym who didn't really have the confidence to try a tier one. So we tried a tier two, but he was just 
miles, miles better than everyone else there because he had that experience and he had all the skill. So he, he decimated them, you know, and, and he never touched tier two again because he was like, I, I don't need to, I don't need that anymore, you know. Um, but what would you say about that, about that rule that current, currently it's um, tier one and tier two athletes can go just about anywhere? Uh, which does mean that you could get someone who is premier series ready down in a tier two competition. Uh, how does that, uh, what, what do you think of that rule? And do you think that should change in future seasons? Um, well, I'm not going to lie. At first, whenever um, they announced, WNL announced this year that they were going to be doing the tier two. And that it was, you, as an athlete, were open to doing whichever one that you like. At first, I was like, I don't know if I agree with this because, um, the idea of an athlete, for lack of term, sandbagging and going into tier two and then getting a championship victory or world strongest or whatever, you know, isn't really the only point. Um, but, I mean, obviously, there's, there's circumstances in which that, you know, for certain athletes, it tends to make sense. But, anyway, speaking in general, um, I didn't really like that. But as the season went on, as I posted and went to and saw, other tier two competitions, other tier one competitions, and, you know, going across the season. I started to maybe not so much understand, but appreciate the fact that it was open up for this season. Because the way I see it, is the way I think after some conversations that I've had with me already, um, and I'm very hopeful that it ends up like this. But basically, I see it at this season as kind of the data mine. Like, like they take. The athletes that competed in both tier two or tier one, only the ones that competed in tier two, only the ones that competed in tier one, as you know, through the magic magic that is in works, be able to see where all of that data is, what it looks like, and then I'm very optimistic and hopeful, and will definitely support and push for as this season comes into the next season. I think it's nine of mm -hmm. WNL. Um, that there is some kind of rule or regulation based off of the first season's data, saying that if you place, you know, in you know this portion of tier two worlds, then you're only allowed to compete in tier one for the next season. Or if you didn't do that, but then you were a tier two athlete that went to tier one worlds and made it into like stage two, or you know maybe won a skill or something like that. Then you have to compete up to one. Um, or if you're an athlete that did both and you did, did, you know, you did pretty good at tier two, but you got decimated at your tier one, like, like you still have tier two as your option to be able to go and you can still compete tier one, but you can do both and it makes sense to do both. Um, something along those lines. Um, because I definitely had to bump out a lot with. At least, at least, not even just in my gym, but in the community, the Texas community, with, with helping people to pick what to do. And so I'm hoping that that, that comes from the league and we get some more, uh, at least better guidelines based off of what I would have and stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Overall, are you still generally optimistic about the future of Tier 2 as we come into Season 9 in the fall? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm super... I'm super excited. I, mean, I like, I like the idea, and I'm hopeful that um, we even get some more tier two qualifiers in season nine. Um, yes, and we get more athletes to, to qualify for worlds. So um, I, I want to see more regions. We only had five active regions, and one of them was in Germany. And so, I mean, hey, there were so many. There were there were a good handful of German competitors who flew out to Texas for this competition. Uh, shout out to my shout out to my homie Marvin. He he flew all the way. I got to compete with him. He was such a nice guy. Um, but yeah, I mean, when, when you've got five regions in total and, and one of them's an entire continent away, you know, it's, uh, it's not, I, I definitely am optimistic for it. I'm just, I'm very hopeful that we get some, you know, in the, in the Midwest or, or anywhere else where I want to see more tier two. Um, I just, I want to see it grow, but, um, there to me is like there is that like mild concern of is there interest in those regions? You know, how many how many of the gyms have their dedicated, you know, teams that are basically all tier one 
and how many of them have those beginners to fill slots for tier two. That's kind of, I, I can understand why they're like, okay, we don't need to do a tier two in this region, but at the same time, fingers crossed something happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I would argue to a lot of those gyms that think that, that, that like, like, I think that there are way more tier two athletes out there than there are tier one athletes. And I would like to see at some point in the future, probably not next year, maybe not even a year after that, but you know, a few years down the line, seeing tier two have more athletes than tier one. Because if that's how the sport is going to go, you know, where you have you know, those progressions that you do, uh, especially with Premier Series now, um, that there should be significantly more tier two athletes out there. Um, so, you know, obviously the more opportunity that's provided for those athletes to shine, the better. Because then we can have bigger events, we can have a stadium in tier two, we can have, you know, some really cool courses, you know, for athletes that really want to be competitive but aren't at the tier one or Premier Series level. Um, so, Absolutely. <laughs> Well, with that, Nick, uh, that does bring us to the end of our interview. Is there any final thoughts that you want to share with our audience here? I mean, I'm, I like, like doing all the course designing and stuff like that. There's a lot of competitions. So I've got my Tier 1 regional coming up. Uh, and we'll have a Premier Series. If you qualify for that, make sure you sign up. Uh, and yeah, uh, I'll hopefully see a lot of people very soon at World's events and stuff like that. And... Good luck to everybody that's competing in all these competitions. So, Nick, I, Nick I, I really look forward to seeing what you've got in store for your regional and for Premier Series, especially Premier Series. Uh, they, I had a blast at Tier 2. You did a great job at making everything look nice, work properly, and just also have it be a fun experience for the competitors. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see what, what else you've got in store in these coming months. For those of you guys who have not seen anything from the Tier 2 World Championships, you can check out the World Ninja League YouTube channel. We live stream both days covering all divisions on the flow and full course. Skills, you might have to ask around for some people. We didn't get those on the live stream. But the main event, the flow and full courses, are all there for you guys. You can see Nick's art perfected in real time with some pretty nice camera angles, I will add, all done remotely by our lovely team and my co-host, Philip Scott. Well, unfortunately, couldn't join us today, but Phil's doing a great job at um, prepping for Worlds right now. Hard at work being the, uh, the absolute boss that we know him to be. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Hope to see you guys in the next episode. I think I, in an ideal world <laughs> at Tier 1 Worlds, um, you would want to probably, at least for me, I, and I, what I want my athletes to do, I would want them to do skills like first on the first day, just as like a get the jitters out right. And then... I have to stop you. I just botched something real bad. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? I have not been recording my audio this whole time. Ooh, my mic has been muted, and I thought it...